<laughs> well, thank you. I was glad to hear Ed uh, use the word extemporaneous because that's pretty much all I had to do. I was once paid a lot of money to give a talk at a, a business conference, and I knew that they expected me to read from a prepared speech, so I walked up to the podium with a sheaf of blank papers <laughs> right on the front and proceeded to give the talk that I wanted to give, which had nothing to do with what was on the blank sheets. So that's <laughs> one reason, thanks. I'm glad uh, Ed made that point. The other is that the first of three things that I'm going to talk to you about tonight is indeed the man in the high castle and the Amazon movies. But first, let me just, uh, actually, television series, not movie. But first, let me just preface this by saying, you know, we talk a lot about science fiction. I mean, everybody here knows what science fiction is. But the truth of the matter is, there's precious little science fiction in which the main theme is science combined in some kind of fictional situation. As a matter of fact, I realized a long time ago, most so-called science fiction is actually philosophy of science fiction, or sociology of science fiction, or language of science fiction. So if you think about Isaac Asimov's Foundation Trilogy, how many of you have read that? Uh, a few more, I guess, than have read you know, some of the other books that we're, we're talking about here. I've read that uh, trilogy three or four times. Uh, the first time in the so-called golden age of science fiction, which refers not to the 1950s when the uh, trilogy was first published, but to the age of the reader, when you're 9, 10, 11 years old. That's the golden age of science fiction. And, and I realized then that it had really not that much to do with science. You know, psychohistory, predicting the future, it was really about how we know, and what's known in philosophy as epistemology. But my guess is the publishers thought it would be a little too much to basically try to label this philosophy hyphen of hyphen uh, science fiction. So they just went with the science fiction. So that's something I think that we should keep in mind whenever we talk about science fiction, including what you're hearing tonight about semantics and science fiction and various threads of philosophy and science fiction. But let's get to the first of the three things that I want to talk to you about. It's indeed the man in the high castle. And not only that, it takes up precisely where Ed left off. How many of you have seen that on uh, Amazon? All right, well, I'll try not to give anything away. But as Ed correctly said, in the novel, there is a sort of alternate history within the alternate history which tells the story that we know from our reality. So just to make this a little more clear, the alternate history in the Man of the High Castle, the prime alternate history is Nazi Germany and Japan won the Second World War. And you know that was a very provocative thing to write in 1962. But Philip K. Dick included in that novel th this manuscript that was circulating, which told the story of what really happened, pretty much how we, in fact, won the Second World War. Now, the idea of including uh, you know, a sort of subversive secret manuscript, I have no idea if this is the case, but I would guess that Philip K. Dick came up with that idea from 1984 where the Emanuel Manuscript plays that uh, role in that story. But, as Ed correctly pointed out, and uh, you know, it was wise to note that, in the television series that Amazon has put on, that alternative history within an alternative history, The Grasshopper, is a series of news and obviously, newsreels, old, shaky newsreels, you know, the kind of things that people would see in theaters in the 40s and 50s. And I'm old enough to even remember the very end of that era. That's a great way of presenting this alternate history within an alternate history. But I reviewed 
uh, The Man in the High Castle when it was shown on Amazon. And more recently, wrote a small book called Fake News in Real Context. And one of the things about this new book that I've written, it's published on Amazon, primarily as a Kindle. You can get a paperback copy of it if you like. But the paperback copy feeds off what's on the Kindle edition. Anyway, one of the really cool things about this is I can update the book whenever I want. And I do update it all the time. And I guess this is unfair to people who buy the book and then I update it, but too bad. You know, you have to make decisions. Anyway, when I was updating uh, this book uh, a month or two ago, <coughs> fake news, of course, has become really prominent in the media. And uh, as some of you also may know, Kellyanne Conway began talking about alternative facts. And it sort of hit me that these newsreels in the Amazon version of The Man in the High Castle are the fake news of that story. Because the truth, as far as we know in this alternate universe, is that Japan and Nazi Germany won the Second World War. So what then are these newsreels? They're, they're carefully prepared fake news. So this is yet another example of what a genius Philip K. Dick was. I mean, he basically wrote this in 1962, and he predicted, in effect, this controversy that we're now having. Now, one of the things about all of Philip K. Dick's work, and something else that really makes him a genius, is you never know, and his characters never know, what's true and what's fake in his universes. It constantly goes back and forth. How many of you saw the movie Total Recall? So again, I don't want to give much away, but the twist in the movie and also in the short story is what's real and what's the dream that, uh, that that whole story is based on. And Philip K. Dick loved treading that line and sort of flipping back and forth between dream reality and basically taunting and even torturing his characters to figure out which was real and which was not. And certainly taunting his readers to figure out which was real and which was not. So I think it's an exquisite example of science fiction, which again, people always talk about how science fiction predicts things, and it does in a technological sense. But here, the science fiction of Philip K. Dick actually predicted the predicament that we now find ourselves in. What's fake and what's real? Donald Trump has denounced as fake news anything that he doesn't like. Um, you know, maybe it's fake, maybe it isn't. What is the ultimate proof that anything is real? And getting back again to when I was a little kid, I remember when I was very young and I saw people looking at the New York Times and reading it. I remember, you know, this was the kind of like wise-ass kid I was. I remember I was asked, them, well, how do you know that's real? I mean, how do you know that's true? How do you know someone didn't just make up a story and put it in the New York Times, did you see that actually happen? And the answer, of course, is no, unless you're the reporter. And we don't usually know reporters in person. So that was the kind of uh, you know precocious question that a kid might have asked in the 1950s. But here we are in 2017, and this is the question we're constantly asking ourselves today. That's the first of three things I want to talk to you about. The second, Lance mentioned Westworld. And actually, Westworld, as Lance also mentioned, you can't get much more explicit than Westworld specifically talking about the bicameral mind in its artificial intelligence narrative. And in case you don't know, in case you've been on Pluto somewhere, <laughs> Westworld, the HBO television series, is based on a, a movie that was made decades ago. And it's about a theme park. The one with Yul Brynner. That's right. right. Yul Brynner played the gunslinger. And, it's a, and a Michael Crichton, 
Space, who was responsible for the movie. Uh, and it's basically a story of, of a theme park that's developed with a real twist. There are artificially intelligent beings, androids, to give the customers a really good time. If you think about Disney and you know these various you know puppets waving at you, Westworld just takes that to one big extent greater. Freeze motor functions. What? Freeze motor functions. Right. So the uh, the point though is, what happens when you develop these androids? To such an extent, you do it so well that they're human. And this then pitches you again, not into a scientific question, but a profound ethical question, which is, do we have the right to treat sentient beings that we have invented as slaves, as expect them to do our bidding and our orders. So one of the things I've been thinking about, and this harkens back to an article I wrote back in the mid-90s, the 1990s that is, I'm not a time travel, so it's not the 1890s, called The Civil Rights of Robots. And unlike most of my works, you can get this one for free. It's on uh, academia.edu and ResearchGate or whatever, so you're welcome to read it. But it basically deals with this question that what, what I see as a profound ethical paradox. If we succeed more than we even could expect and invent something, and the whole way in which this was invented was we're inventing these machines to do our work, or in the case of Westworld, to entertain us, to amuse us in an amusement park. What happens when these beings evince human intelligence? I think it's a really tough question. I mean, certainly, you know, I think most of us would say we would be wrong to order those beings around. Well, Westworld, in its own way, does a very good job uh, at exploring this. And um, if you're really interested in this issue, I'd also recommend a show uh, that comes from Britain. It's in its second season now. It's called Humans. Uh, it was done by the BBC, and I think it's on AMC uh, here in the United States. And unlike Westworld, which again features all this in an amusement park gone crazy, in humans, the intelligent androids are much more integrated in our lives. And, you know, these questions arise. Uh, you know, apropos sex, you mentioned something about sex, right? So I can blame it. Robot you. sex. Robot sex, good. Uh, apropos of that, um, it, 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 there's a, a, a beautiful female android who is in a family's home. Is it okay? And, and her job is to totally make life better for everyone in the family. Is it okay for the husband you know, <laughs> to sleep with her? And if you look at the uh, you know actresses who play these robots, that certainly seems to be a not unreasonable uh, expectation. But obviously, you know. The, the marriage, uh, you know, that's there is also real, and the wife might not feel good about it. And, you know, it can happen the other way as well. Is that in a film or a book? This is a this is a television show called Humans. Humans? Yes. Oh. AMC. Uh, AMC. Again, oh. uh, high recommend. Done very well. Keep up It's done very well. Um, and uh, you know, I don't want to spend too much more time uh, on this, but Humans also deals with something that I first uh, came across, and maybe it wasn't the first place I came across it, but it's the best uh, treatment, in a 1991 novel by Charles Platt called The Silicon Man. And in uh, this novel, someone in those days, it's before we had anything really portable, is they figure out how to upload a person's mentality or if you want to get more mystical about its soul, to a mainframe computer. And what then do we owe that mainframe computer? I mean, is that mainframe computer in some sense human? 
And this is not done trivially. It could be done because someone, God forbid, has a fatal disease and it's a, a way of achieving a kind of immortality. So I think that, that those ethical, philosophic questions, uh, we're in an age where they're receiving you know, really excellent treatment, not only in the written mode, but on the screen. And that leads me to the last and final uh, example I want to talk to you about. And it's also based on something that someone said previously. Lance mentioned that some of my works have been dramatized. Well, uh, in 1995, I wrote a novelette called The Chronology Protection Case. It was published in Analog Magazine. And the novel was nominated for the Nebula Award Damn it, it didn't win it, but okay, it was an honor just to be nominated. There was nobody like Faye Dunaway and one day we could you know, get that rough. I didn't even have a, a, you know, a glimpse of possibly winning. But it's been reprinted five times. It's been made into a high budget radio play with all the trimmings by Mark Shanahan. That was nominated for an Edgar Award. And it's been made into an unbelievably low-budget movie. Uh, you've heard of movies, you know, that were made on a shoestring. I, you know, this was made, I, I don't know what, on like a piece of skin from someone's thumb. I mean, you know, not even a shoestring. But nonetheless, you know, the movies attracted a cult following. Jay Kensinger uh, made that movie. And actually, in 2012 and 13, we decided to add on uh, a new ending. Uh, and in case you're interested in seeing the movie, and then I'll tell you why I'm talking about it for reasons other than just abject self-promotion, you can see it for free on Amazon Prime. Somehow Amazon Prime got really desperate, and they said, hey, can we put your movie on Prime? I said, yeah, absolutely, don't have to ask for us. Well, what's the name of it? It's called The Chronology Protection Case. Chronology Protection Case? Yes. So let me just tell you a little bit about it and then what this has to do with these philosophic, uh, general semantic media ecological questions. First of all, the chronology protection case, this title that I came up with, comes from something that Stephen Hawking talked about about five or six years before I wrote the novelette in 1995. And he calls it the chronology protection conjecture. And what Hawking basically says is, even if it were possible to time travel, the universe wouldn't let that happen. Because the universe would, in effect, act in its own protection and would get in the way of an attempt to time travel, which, if you travel to the past, it, it could unravel the whole cause and effect nature of the universe. I mean, briefly on that, you've all heard of the grandparent paradox. If I travel to the past and somehow advertently or inadvertently pre prevent my grandparents from meeting, well then how did I exist in the first place to travel to the past? You know, there are some answers. You could, there's, there's a so-called multiple worlds explanation. PL1 in universe one travels to the past, prevents his grandparents from meeting, so PL is never born. But how did I travel to the past? Because the instant I stopped my grandparents from meeting, that created a new universe or a new reality, call it universe two, in which PL doesn't exist, but PL1 comes from the universe in which I did exist, if that makes any sense to you. So, but that's crazy. I mean, if you had uh, a, a, an existence in which at every drop of the time traveler's hat, a new universal reality was brought into being, that would be even crazier than a Philip K. Dick novel. So, or even this, what's fake news and what's real news? Only during the significant moments. Yes, well, so <laughs> every moment is significant. But, so, I don't think actually time travel is possible, and neither does uh, Stephen Hawking, because he said the universe, to prevent that from happening, will get in the way. If like someone discovers a wormhole and tries to send something through it, when you send something through it, the universe will put up some kind of obstacle. That's what Stephen Hawking said. In my demented mind, prone to write science fiction, I, was, I had just started writing like a murder mystery. It wasn't even really science fiction at that time. And I said, hey, 
this is a, this is a good idea for a science fiction story because let's say there are a group of scientists working on time travel. They're working on building a time machine, and they suddenly start dying. Maybe it's not just some jealous scientist. Maybe it's not the dean of their department who wants them to spend more time teaching classes. Maybe it's the universe acting in its own protection. And maybe the universe will so aggressively enforce this that anybody who even knows how to build a time machine and starts publicizing this will be eliminated by the universe. So that's basically the setup of the story. But back then when I was writing it, and I thought about this again about 15 minutes before I came to the Players Club. No, it was a little, you know, maybe yesterday. <laughs> um, I realized that, I, and I didn't even think of this when I was writing this in 1995, what this is really all about, that is, the universe might kill you if you think about building a time machine and you know how to build it. This is a classic example of Václavík's The Spontaneous Paradox. Do any of you remember that? This was one of the things that uh, we talked about. Uh, Neil and Chris especially uh, you know, loved it uh, in our class. W what it is, I think it has something to do with general semantics, but even if it doesn't, who cares? I think it's, it's good. Anyway, um, w w what it basically is is if someone says to you, hey, be spontaneous. You know, don't just sit you know, with your prepared text, be spontaneous. And then you like stand up and you act in a spontaneous way you are defeating the very command because if you respond in a spontaneous way when someone asks you to be spontaneous, you are ipso facto not being spontaneous. So in a way, the chronology protection case, and if you do get to see it, send me an email or let me know how you like it, is just another version of the be spontaneous paradox writ large. And the characters, without mentioning that, begin to realize that. Okay, uh, Marlene Barr is waiting in the wings. I want to thank you again. It's good to be here with all these heads. Yeah.